Well, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Akash Pound and I am delighted to be chairing today's event and to welcome Mark Drakeford back to the Institute for Government for this discussion. Um, this is the latest in a series of, of ongoing events we've been holding over, over recent months with politicians from across the UK at which we've been exploring various different perspectives on the future of devolution and the union. Mark Drakeford, our guest today, has been leader of the Welsh Labour Party and First Minister of Wales since 2018. And, and prior to that, he served in a number of other ministerial positions. He was Minister for Finance, Minister for Brexit, Minister of Health as well. Um, he has represented Cardiff West in the Senate and, and, and previously the National Assembly for Wales, as it was known, um, for a decade. And before that, he was a special advisor to the then First Minister, Rodri Morgan. So it's fair to say that uh, he's been around devolution and the Welsh government pretty much for the entirety of, uh, of its existence, uh, the, the two decades that we've had devolved government in Wales. Um, just two months ago, um, he led Welsh Labour to a sixth successive devolved election victory. The party won um, 30, so uh, exactly half of the 60 seats up for grabs in the Senate, the Welsh Parliament. Um, and that was, I think, in many ways, quite an interesting election as far as the future of the Constitution is concerned. Welsh voters were, as people who followed it will recall, offered a very full menu of different possible constitutional options. You had Plaid Cymru, um, putting the idea of independence very firmly at the centre of their agenda. You had, on the other end of the, uh, of the spectrum, abolish the assembly, um, promising what it says on the tin. Um, and you had the Conservatives standing on a pledge effectively of no change, no further devolution, stick with the status quo. Welsh Labour, for its part, stood on a manifesto of change, of further devolution and of various other reforms that the party and, and Mark Drakeford um, argue are necessary to, to strengthen the union and, and keep the UK together. And having been elected, returned to office on this manifesto, the Welsh government quickly uh, revised and republished a, a rather interesting publication under the title Reforming Our Union, Shared Governance in the UK, which contains 20 propositions for uh, specific changes to uh, the devolution arrangements in, in, in Wales and more generally to, to the union as a whole. Um, and it sets those propositions um, in within a kind of wider narrative about the constitution as a whole and, and the principles that, that underpin or should underpin the union. So it is those proposals and that wider agenda that uh, we're delighted that uh, the First Minister is going to discuss with us today. So we have about an hour, well, up to one o'clock for this event. Um, in a few moments, I'm gonna hand over to uh, to the First Minister. He's going to give a, a short introductory speech um, and then that will be followed by questions and discussion in the usual way. I'm very keen to bring in the audience. So anyone watching live, um, please do add your questions um, to the using the chat function on Microsoft Teams. If possible, do also uh, say who you are so I don't have to keep citing anonymous people. Um, and um, you can also upvote other people's questions and then I'll take that into account as I select particular questions to put to Mr Drakeford. Um, if you also want to join the discussion on Twitter, um, we are live tweeting it there using the hashtag IFGDevo. OK, so I think that's enough from me for now. Uh, Mark, very uh, great to have you with us. Thanks for, for taking the time to, to take part in this event. And uh, the floor is yours. Well, Akash, uh, thank you very much, dear Thamaud, and uh, thank you to the Institute uh, for Government as well for the continued interest uh, that the Institute takes in these very serious matters and for making sure that Wales's voice 
uh, is always heard as part of these deliberations. Uh, I'm going to start with the most uh, straightforward of propositions, and that is that I, the Welsh Government and uh, Welsh Labour, continue to believe in a strong and durable union. Uh, our view remains that a voluntary association of nations working together within the framework of the United Kingdom is good for Wales, and at the same time that the United Kingdom is better for having Wales as one of the partners within it. Uh, our citizens derive tangible benefits from that partnership. We benefit from the pooling of resources and our common history of social progress, while of course celebrating the rich cultural diversity of uh, the four nations that make up the UK. The United Kingdom has in the past been a powerful engine for the redistribution of resources, and it can be again. So if that's our starting point, strong devolution in a successful United Kingdom, then what's the current state of play? Well, it's inevitable that today uh, we will focus on the problems uh, that exist and the prescription for the solution of those problems that we set out in reforming uh, of our union. But I wanted to begin by just being clear that from a Welsh perspective, the picture is not entirely bleak, that even in the challenging circumstances we face, there are positive aspects to the relationship between Wales and other parts of the United Kingdom, including the UK government. Ever since the turn of the year, we've had weekly calls uh, between the first ministers of the devolved administrations and uh, Michael Gove as minister in charge of the cabinet office. I think they have evolved into something genuinely useful. They need to be more than they are, we have to move beyond uh, the ad hoc, uh, but nevertheless, the frequency of the meetings and the nature of the meetings, I think demonstrates that we can find ways of coming together in a way that shares common uh, issues, helps us to develop common solutions. Uh, secondly, the intergovernmental review, Glacial as its progress has been, does now appear to be coming to uh, a final fruition. Uh, the UK government published on the 24th of March, a document summarising progress to date, identifying places where progress was still uh, needed. I am told by our officials that there is progress in those areas too. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we will see the review concluded, you know, in the near future, and that will be another achievement. The common frameworks are an achievement. Uh, I wish more was made uh, of them because the work that goes into them demonstrates that we are able to reach agreements between us uh, on a voluntary basis, and that those are agreements to which we are all then uh, committed. Below the surface, outside the spotlight of you know, everyday politics, uh, then there is still the possibility of making progress on shared agendas. It's long been uh, an ambition of the Welsh Government uh, to find a solution to the fact that women who are sentenced to imprisonment in Wales are always taken outside Wales to serve that period of imprisonment. There's no women's prison of any sort inside Wales. That creates enormous difficulties for the families and the women concerned. And the fact that we have been able to agree with the Ministry of Justice that the first new women's residential centre in the United in England and Wales will be in Wales is, you know, a, a genuine achievement and we are very keen to play our part in it. And maybe finally, uh, in uh, just this brief demonstration of the fact that, you know, good things still do happen, uh, the vaccination programme seems to me to be a pretty good example of the sort of United Kingdom we would wish to go on belonging to. The fact that 
the UK government has been able to purchase stocks of vaccine using the power of having 60 million people that you're purchasing on behalf of in the marketplace and are doing it very successfully uh, as well, seems to me to demonstrate a case for the UK, while the implementation of a vaccination lies with the four nations, lies with the health services that are closest to the ground, the closest to the circumstances of the people who live in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and uh, England. And a combination of using the effective authority of the UK government to purchase, but making sure that the delivery of vaccination is done by people who understand the circumstances of the places they are serving, seems to me a pretty good example of how we can work together successfully. So that's the good news. Uh, the less good news is that all of this does seem to me to be against the grain of a series of tides which flow in the opposite direction. And those are tides which I think have been gathering pace. They're incoming tides, not receding time tides. Complexities of Northern Ireland, the position of the Scottish government and a UK government, which almost every day fails to make the case for a union of solidarity between the peoples of this multinational state and the benefits it can all bring to all of us. The nature of the failure was highlighted by Sir David Liddington, the Deputy Prime Minister in the May administration only two years ago. Uh, he said in the lecture at Cambridge University last month that the union, this is the quotation, is in greater peril than at any moment in my lifetime. Now, uh, I agree with that conclusion. I'm dispirited by what seemed to me to be the willful refusal of the UK government to enter into the kind of dialogue and to help with a generation of the sorts of thought processes that would lead to the case for a viable and sustainable future for the Union. And that just seems to be inescapable. And that's part of my puzzlement at the failure of the UK government to come to the table with the sort of energy and the sort of mindset that would allow those of us who believe in the future of the Union to develop a case for it that would make anybody in any part of the United Kingdom want to continue to be in membership of it. And you know, when I say it's unavoidable, in the next five years, in the time of the current Senate term, we will have to grapple with the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol and what that is doing to the views of citizens in Northern Ireland. We will have to grapple with the declared intention of the Scottish Government to hold another referendum on Scottish uh, independence. And from a Welsh perspective, we go on grappling every day on the undermining of devolution in Wales through the operation of the UK Internal Market uh, Act. Everything that we deal with in reforming our union seems to me to be inescapably the agenda for other governments who also want to create a sustainable future. Here in Wales, grappling with these uh, issues uh, was front and centre in our election, uh, as you heard uh, in the introduction. Uh, it was more on the surface and more explicitly in front of Welsh voters than at any uh, Senate election uh, in my uh, view. I shared platforms in BBC debates in which on one side of me uh, stood the leader of the Abolish, the Assembly Party, arguing for the scrapping of devolution altogether. And immediately on the other side of me stood the leader of Plaid Cymru, who to an extent very different to other Senate elections, put independence, the separation of Wales from the United Kingdom as the main focus of Plaid Cymru's election campaign. Now, 
you know, I spent my time arguing but simplistic assertions that independence offers a magic solution by which all problems can be resolved was not an adequate response to the position we face in Wales today. But in many ways, those who have nothing more to offer beyond flag-waving renditions of the British song are even more culpable. And far from producing the sort of swagger that the UK government thinks that its approach projects. What those actions actually scream out is a lack of confidence, a defensiveness, and a cowering behind uh, an empty front. The United Kingdom will not be saved by that sort of retreat to vacuous symbolism, and still less can it be secured by the deliberate provocations of the UK government internal market uh, act, the removal of funds and powers, the repeated overriding of the Sewell Convention, the wholesale destructive repertoire of the aggressive unilateralism that is too often the hallmark of the present UK government. It doesn't have to be like this, as I demonstrated, I hope, in you know, those success stories that I started out with. And the second edition of reforming our union, shared governance in the United Kingdom, is our attempt to demonstrate the case for reform and for re-energizing the case for the UK. It revisits and restates our propositions for a successful, strong and durable union. It recasts these arguments in the new context created by events since its original publication in October 2019, leaving the European Union, another UK general, election, navigating a global pandemic, the establishment of a constitutional convention to be led by former Prime Minister Gordon Brown and indeed our own Welsh election in May of this year. And despite the complex and contested arena into which it is launched, at its heart, reforming our union as a relatively simple set of ideas for a union that can thrive and prosper, not in spite of devolution, but because of devolution. Proceeds from the radical but simple proposition that nearly a quarter of a century now into the devolution project, sovereignty is dispersed amongst the four elected legislatures of the United Kingdom. And in my view, this is a matter of fact, even if it is not of law, de facto it is the way things happen, if it's not de jure. Uh, the United Kingdom can go on existing, not because there is a single sovereign body at Westminster capable of overturning anything and everything that peoples in the four nations have decided for themselves, but because the peoples of the United Kingdom choose to continue to pool their sovereignty and to protect the social and economic rights that citizens in all parts of the United Kingdom have won and have hard won for themselves as well. Once the central proposition is grasped, much flows from it. The permanency of devolution, other than by the decision in our case in Wales, of the people of Wales themselves. The redrawing of the reserved devolved border, the codification and reduction in scope of the Sewell Convention, the reform and entrenchment of new machinery of government to bring the four nations together for common purposes, the replacement of the Barnett formula with new arrangements based on need, and stripped of the arbitrary power that the Treasury continues to hug to itself and which mars the current settlement. So imagine a UK which can negotiate confidently and seriously with the European Union and other international partners because it knows that the four nations are collaborating properly on the joint positions which ensure treaty obligations are met and benefit all parts of the Union. Imagine a UK which is proud of its four nations and celebrates them abroad instead of trying to define them out of existence. Imagine 
an internal market in the UK governed by common frameworks agreed between the nations and voluntarily entered into. With legislative underpinning agreed between the four governments and legislatures. With the Reform House of Lords explicitly protecting our quasi federal constitution and expressing a sense of the union's political geography, recognizing and celebrating diversity approach across the UK, as well as guaranteeing trade across and within it, and all of that delivering co-investment by UK and devolved governments in jointly developed schemes that respect the devolution settlement. That's the sort of United Kingdom that I want to live in, and that's the sort of United Kingdom that I think I can go on selling to people in Wales as being in their interests. And I think it would amount to an attractive set of propositions in other parts of the UK as well. It's the sort of United Kingdom that reforming our union aspires to create. Now the 20 proposals in our document are not put forward on the basis that they contain all the answers. The publication is our contribution to a debate, a debate that we believe is unavoidable and urgently necessary. This week, we have set out our intentions to engage directly with civil society and Welsh citizens on these matters. And we wanted to publish reforming our union early in this term so that it's available to inform that debate inside Wales and beyond our own borders. A positive case for the United Kingdom has to be made and remade time after time. It's a case that needs to be based on the capacity for reform in the United Kingdom. That's forward looking and describes the sort of successful future that we think is there to be described. What it can't be is a retreat into the past or a manifestly misguided belief that the existing system is working well. Those like the Welsh government who believe in the benefits of the union cannot take it for granted. That's why we're very pleased <coughs> for me to be here today in the Institute for Government as part of that ongoing conversation. Looking forward very much to hearing other people's views and where I can to respond to them. Thank you very much uh, for that really thought provoking speech, um, Mark. There's loads of really interesting ideas as, and, and specific proposals in the speech and in, and, and in the document. Um, and we're getting lots of questions in already, I can see from the audience. Um, so thank you for those. And I'll, I'll start to bring some of those specific questions in shortly. Um, I just want to start, though, with a couple of questions about the the big picture before we kind of delve into some of the detailed points. Um, so first of all, I mean, in your speech and and, and more generally, of course, you, you've made a, a, a strong positive case for why the union is good for Wales and, and for all parts of the UK in your view. Um, however, in the, uh, the document in the Reforming Our Union paper, uh, one of the lines that stuck out to me from your, your forward to that uh, paper was that it has become harder and harder to make the case for the union due to, I think, some of the sort of uh, what you would call aggressively unilateral actions that the UK government has has taken from, from your perspective. So my question is, if that case is getting so much harder to make, can you imagine if things continue in the way they seem to be going, ever reaching the point where you conclude actually the union isn't the right uh, future for, for Wales and, and, and maybe independence would be a better way to defend Wales's interests? Well, a larger number of Welsh citizens have already come to that conclusion with any time uh, in my political lifetime, if you believe in the, the various uh, opinion tests that have been carried out 
it didn't uh, manifest itself in votes for Plaid Cymru uh, after last Senate election when you know, an independent Wales was their main uh, proposition. You know, Plaid Cymru once again lost ground rather than gained ground in the Senate election. So the, the evidence is a bit equivocal, uh, but certainly amongst young people, I, I think the notion that Wales could uh, go it alone and should go it alone is more attractive today than it's ever been before. Uh, and that is partly, as I said, in my forward, because making the case for the union uh, in the face of a government which is so disrespectful uh, of devolution, led by a prime minister who told his own backbenchers that devolution was the greatest mistake uh, of the Blair years. And, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, uh, Downing Street have to mount a, uh, an attempt to sort of, you know, brush that to one side and claim that it wasn't really what he meant and so on. But you can't unsay these things once they are said, and they've lodged, you know, that has lodged itself in the consciousness of people here uh, in Wales. But I don't think myself, but it, as I said, I, I'm quite sure it is not too late uh, to restore the fortunes of the United Kingdom in the minds of Welsh uh, people. And it's important not to mistake the temporary occupation of the seat of power in the United Kingdom for the United Kingdom itself. Um, so, the, the hill has become steeper. It's the first time in the history of devolution we have faced a government that is explicitly hostile to the idea of devolution and determined mm. to roll it back and to assert itself in that sort of chest beating, highly unattractive chest beating way uh, that the UK government now uh, demonstrates. Uh, but that is temporary and uh, there are more permanent interests that bind us together. Okay, uh, thanks. And so on that point of um, what you see as the, the, the hostility of, of the current government to, um, to do devolution, um, you've identified specific things like the passage of the U UK Internal Market Act, um, the plans of the government, the UK government that is, to, to take a more active role in, in devolved policy domains like economic development in Wales, um, to, to, to spend money in, in Wales uh, in, in areas that have previously been the Welsh government's responsibility and so on and and I can I can certainly understand why from your perspective that is seen as a as a hostile uh, attempt to, 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 to undermine devolution. The UK government of course would argue that what they're trying to do is to to strengthen the union by demonstrating to voters all across the country the value of coordinated UK wide action, the value of investment delivered from, from Whitehall, from Westminster, um, and that that actually is the best way to, to, to combat nationalism. Um, so I just wonder, I mean, do, do you think there's, a, there's any chance that they might, that they might be right that some voters don't essentially care whether money to regenerate town centres or build new transport systems and so on comes from Cardiff or comes from Westminster and therefore that more active UK government uh, role could actually help to, to bind the nations together. That would be their point of view. Well, I, I think there are two things that will matter to people in Wales. Uh, first would be <clears throat> that the UK government uh, discharges its own responsibility uh, in Wales in a way that demonstrates its commitment to Wales. Uh, so we have outstanding examples of where the UK government year in year out fails to do that. Investment in the railway network would be the most outstanding example where you know, Wales has 11% of the rail track uh, of the United Kingdom has had 2% of its investment. Uh, in the last uh, decade. There's a real test coming from the UK for the UK government on this issue because the uh, Union Connectivity Review carried out by Sir Peter Hendry uh, positively recommends major investment on the Wales mainline uh, in South Wales. Uh, and that is a UK government's responsibility. A UK government that was genuinely uh, committed to demonstrating the capacity of the UK government to do things that help to keep the UK 
together would follow that recommendation. Uh, and we'll see if, uh, if that happens. Uh, people will be more convinced, I think, if the UK government is prepared uh, to meet its obligations in relation to coal tip safety in South Wales. Now, here's a, here's a major issue in our context. In the last two winters, with extreme weather events, we have seen coal tips move down the mountain in Wales in ways that have genuinely threatened local communities. You know, and this is Wales, where the memory of Aberfan uh, is known to every, uh, to every family. Uh, yet I have a letter from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury only yesterday, refusing to fund uh, the legacy issues that clearly predate devolution by many decades, uh, and which the Chief Secretary to the Treasury entirely spuriously seeks to argue are somehow our responsibility uh, to fix. So there's no money for, from the UK government when it comes to the responsibilities they already have, and yet there are bits of money when they want to interfere in responsibilities that are not theirs. Okay. What matter to people in Wales is, you know, it, it's not that people don't care who, where the money comes from. They will want to see public money, scarce public money, well spent. Uh, and UK programmes that entirely ignore the Welsh Government. The Welsh Government is not even a consultee in some of these uh, new spending programmes, just guarantees that the money will be wastefully uh, expended and people in Wales will not appreciate that. Yes, OK, and quick Institute for Government plug. We have a paper actually coming out um, next week on the, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which is one of these new spending programmes the UK government is putting in place to, to replace EU spending, um, in which we, we look at this issue of, of how it's being rolled out without uh, much involvement at all of, of the devolved government. So um, that's just one for people to look out for. OK, so um, yeah, just to, to move on to um, some of the specific proposals in your speech and the white paper, um, a lot of the a lot of the ideas you set out there um, sound like federalism by by another name. So we're talking about divided sovereignty in place of unitary parliamentary sovereignty, constitutional entrenchment of the devolution settlements, maybe a codified constitution, institutionalized uh, intergovernmental relations and, and, and so on. And I, I noted you used the word quasi-federal in the speech just now. So do you consider yourself a, a federalist and, and, and what does that mean to you if so? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think there's no doubt that the, the sort of future of the United Kingdom that we uh, envisage has more federal characteristics than the United Kingdom has had uh, up until now. Uh, for us, this means, as we say in the paper, and as I tried to say earlier, it means a recognition of the fact that 20 and more years into devolution, uh, sovereignty is now dispersed. You know, decisions are being made every single day uh, in the different nations of the United Kingdom, and we need a form of constitutional uh, superstructure that recognises that fact. But the United Kingdom only goes on being a United Kingdom when the different component parts of the United Kingdom and their peoples want that to happen, where they voluntarily uh, put, pool together uh, their sovereignty for shared uh, purposes. And I don't think we shy away from the idea that that would need to be codified. You know, uh, it's more a personal view than the Welsh government view, but you know, I think that there's a a quite a wide range of wide range on the spectrum of ways in which those constitutional things can be written down. Uh, and I would myself tend to be more at the lighter end of that, you know, not at the heavy end of very detailed and uh, very lengthy uh, written constitutions, but more at the written end, which is about principles and um, machineries. And that's the sort of stuff that we try and set out in, in, in our paper. So yes, it is federalist, but it tends to be at the, not at the heavy duty end of that spectrum. And where in the 
future federal or quasi-federal settlement that you'd like to see us move towards, does England fit in? I mean, I appreciate that your, your job is, of course, head of the Welsh government, but I think in your proposals, you've been clear that you're trying to contribute to a wider debate across the whole UK. And any time people come, bring up the idea of a federal settlement for, for, for the UK, the immediate follow up is, well, where do, what, what do you do with England? Do you have an English parliament? Is more regionalisation the answer? Um, and I will actually put a question to you that we've just had as well, since this is the week that English votes on English laws, which was David Cameron's answer to the English question, was was abolished just yesterday. Um, that there's a question actually from Philip Rycroft. Um, what does what do you make of the abolition of evil, um, and specifically does this have implications for the future of the Sewell Convention, which is a slightly separate point? But yeah, I put those to you. Well, uh, thank you, Rich. Thank you to Philip for uh, for that. The abolition of evil has always been, uh, you know, uh, the ambition of any uh, political party. Uh, but um, in this particular sort of evil, then the thing that strikes me the most uh, is the difference with which with which the uh, English Votes for English Laws was introduced uh, in the Cameron uh, era and the way it has ended, because it began with a bang and it has ended with a whimper, hasn't it? So, you know, Cameron chose the day after the Scottish referendum uh, to make English Votes for English Laws the main thing that he said in response to it. Now, I think that was a desperate mistake, uh, by the way, and I think he has said himself, but he, he now regrets the timing uh, of that. But you couldn't have had that topic injected into a hotter political context, couldn't you? Could you? You know, right at the very top of the constitutional agenda. And whatever you know, people might think about it as a solution to uh, Englishness, uh, at least it was hotly debated and put there on centre stage. The demise of uh, evil seemed to be smuggled out later on a Friday afternoon in the sort of press notice that the government hopes nobody will ever notice. So, you know, I think, I just think that tells you something about the different level of seriousness with which this government takes all these matters compared to other governments, even of a uh, conservative persuasion. Uh, Akash, as you said, it, it is in many ways not for me to be telling people elsewhere in the United Kingdom how they should organise their own affairs. I will say that I thought that Andy Burnham uh, gave some very powerful testimony to the House of Lords, to that committee that is currently considering uh, all of this when he gave evidence to them last week. Uh, and you know, Andy was recognising the difference between you know, nationhood and regionalism, but still arguing for, uh, again, you know, a more consistent approach to devolution, regionalization within England itself, rather than, as it seems to me at a distance, the incredibly piecemeal way in which you know, different regional mayors have completely different sets of powers and reach and so on. We do say at least two things about this in our, our paper, a less controversial uh, one, because it's you know, widely canvassed by others, is a reform of the House of Lords to make it an elected body that has a more explicit uh, part to play and in the way that it is uh, framed to represent the nations and the regions at the heart uh, of government. Uh, our second proposal is you know, much more there to be debated and to be improved upon, and that is that we uh, float the idea of a form of qualified majority voting as a way of resolving disputes between the four nations. So in our formula, England could never be outvoted by the three devolved uh, governments ganging up together uh, in, to get its own way. But England could never impose its will on the rest of the United Kingdom unless it had persuaded at least one of the other three governments to vote with it on any proposition. So that's an attempt to try and balance you know, the fact that England is absolutely, by its scale and its size, a dominant partner 
uh, in the United Kingdom, but that that dominance shouldn't be unconstrained, but nor should children be vulnerable uh, to being somehow outvoted by populations that even when you add them all up together is still only a fraction of the size that England represents. Yeah, yeah, no, those are those are um, interesting specific proposals. I, I, I know the Welsh government has 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 been making for some time. Um, OK, let's um, let's move on to some of the other issues that that you cover um, in, in, in the paper and speech. So um, one of the changes you, 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 you'd like to see made um, is I think you just referred to it now, actually, in the context of England, is to to have a more consistent and systematic approach to deciding which powers should be held at which level. And, and specifically, I think you advocate that we should bring in the, the concept or principle of subsidiarity, um, which holds that powers should be held at the lowest possible level at which they can be um, exercised efficiently and effectively. Um, if we were to do that, um, what specific changes do you think or what would be the biggest changes you think that would make to where we are now in terms of which powers are held at Westminster, which powers are held at in Cardiff, and also maybe which powers are held subnationally within Wales, because subsidiarity, you know, can can point towards greater localization too. Well, in the Welsh uh, specific context, you know, our argument is is that the current drawing of the line between reserved and devolved. Uh, powers is completely unstable. Uh, it doesn't bear examination. And what I would like to see is we'll get to a position where the, the cut of responsibilities is stable. I don't believe it can be permanent because you know, politics always develops. But it does definitely need attention because uh, I, I gave evidence myself yesterday to the same House Lords Committee that Andy Burnham had been in front of, but I pointed to the fact that the 2017 Government of Wales Act concludes that uh, the devolved level of government should be responsible for uh, train services, for bus services, for taxi services, uh, for roads and everything that goes with active travel uh, and so on, but not hovercrafts. Well, you tell me why. Why did the UK government decide uh, that while it was right and proper for us to be responsible for everything else, somehow hovercrafts or something that could only be decided at the, the UK level? And the settlement is shot full of anomalies uh, of that sort. Uh, so on a big uh, front, I suppose justice is the single biggest thing that we think uh, there is a compelling case for adding to the repertoire of devolved powers. The Thomas Commission, commission headed by Lord Thomas of Cumquia, the former Lord Chief Justice, had the misfortune to report in October 2019, just as the Brexit denouement was uh, at its height and just before coronavirus hit and it's never had the attention that it deserves, you know, it makes a compelling practical case for why justice services would be better in Wales if they were exercised at a devolved level here, as they are in Scotland, as they are uh, in Northern Ireland. Inside Wales, though, uh, Akash, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, subsidiarity doesn't stop at, at Cardiff. Well, we finally succeeded in the dying uh, weeks of the last Senate term in getting the first major reform of local government uh, legislation onto the statute book here. Uh, and it is, a, it is a statute book that, you know, it is a statute that now responds to that subsidiarity argument. It allows local authorities to come together to discharge functions, but we will then be able to strengthen to be discharged at that level because it will be the most efficient and effective, to use your terms, uh, level at which those things can be uh, discharged. And those powers will initially be in the fields of transport, uh, land use, uh, planning and economic development, but there are further uh, possibilities beyond that once local government has absorbed that first set of 
uh, newly discharged responsibilities. OK, thanks. And uh, one final question from me directly, and then there's a few I want to bring in, is around reform to the the, the fiscal arrangements underpinning devolution. So I know you again in, in, in the paper you suggest or the Welsh government's position is that there should be a new UK fiscal framework that again in a more kind of consistent way sets out rules around funding of, of devolution in, in all parts of the country. Um, and among other things, I think what you suggest is that that would make it easier for the Welsh government and the other devolved governments to, to introduce new devolved taxes. Um, so I just wonder if you could expand on that. Are there particular taxes that you are you think would be useful to introduce or other changes to, to current taxes and, and, and uh, fiscal arrangements that you'd like to see happen? Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you a rather sad story uh, here, but it is a sad story that I think does illustrate uh, the current set of circumstances. So the 2017 Government of Wales Act, passed by a Conservative uh, government, uh, has within it uh, a process by which the Welsh Government can um, make application, and I'm afraid it is a bit like that, to the UK Government for powers to create new taxes to be drawn down. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a new piece of machinery, and we decided that we would test that machinery with a relatively uncontroversial and narrow proposal. So we developed a proposal for a vacant land tax in Wales to deal with land banking and to uh, deal with land being hoarded for you know, profiteering purposes. We based it largely on a vacant land tax recently and successfully introduced in the Republic uh, of Ireland. And we set our little uh, idea off uh, to go round the circuit of this new uh, machinery uh, back when Theresa May was Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, I would say that we had a genuine engagement uh, on that idea. Uh, officials at the Treasury worked quite intensively with our officials to provide the information that was needed to pass the tests so that we had both agreed needed to be uh, passed in order before such powers could be uh, drawn down. And we thought we had got to the end of that process. Uh, in March of last year, we thought everything was now in place, we answered all the questions, and we could complete the journey uh, that the 2017 Act set out. Now, I absolutely concede immediately that that coincided with the onset of coronavirus. So, you know, there was an inevitable uh, hiatus in that. But when we managed to get back into a conversation with the UK government in August of last year, it was to find that the ground had entirely altered and we were being asked to go back to the very start of the process and to answer for a second time all the questions that we had worked very hard already to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I wrote to the Treasury back in September of last year to say this really isn't good enough, you know, this is not how it's meant to be, and we've never heard anything since. In other words, we are now dealing with a completely different political dynamic in which the current UK government has a complete prohibition on any further forms of devolution. It's not what they're about. They're about rolling back devolution, not adding to it. And the mechanisms that they themselves have put in place, the work that they themselves have been involved in, has now been set aside as though it never uh, existed. And that, that is a very salutary and I think very sad uh, tale. Uh, had we succeeded in, you know, demonstrating how that machinery could be used, uh, then there were further ideas, probably larger scale ideas, uh, in the field of, of environment, for example, in terms of plastic taxes, mm. but again, we would have uh, sought to draw down. But having never managed to get the vacant land tax idea running the circuit successfully, there seems very little prospect indeed, or very little worthwhileness 
in trying to get an even bigger idea uh, past a government that is so clearly set against us. Yeah. OK, yeah, another one to area to watch. OK, great. Couple of questions then uh, uh, from, from audience. Thanks for all of these. So uh, Corey Brown Swan, who's from University of Edinburgh, um, says that the challenge seems to be that the most profound thinking on the Constitution seems to be coming from Wales. How can you, uh, the Welsh Government, get others on board with a serious consideration of the union and its structure? There seems to be no appetite in UK Labour for meaningful constitutional thinking. Um, well, uh, Tony, I, I won't completely accept that final point. The Gordon Brown uh, Convention is being set up by uh, UK Labour. I've had a series of conversations with Keir Starmer uh, and with Gordon uh, about it all. And I think it is, you know, they are genuinely serious uh, about it. So I think they're from the point of view of UK Labour, this doesn't have the same urgency that it does for us. Uh, but I think it is a serious uh, effort uh, nonetheless. Uh, how do we get other people to engage with this agenda? Well, I wish we didn't have to rely on the force of events. I wish that we could persuade people to do this thinking before it becomes you know, a complete crisis. Uh, but I think that the crisis will be coming. Crisis will be coming because of the way in which a border has been created down the Irish Sea uh, and because there is a Scottish government that has won an election uh, and uh, is able to argue that it has a mandate to put uh, a further proposition to the Scottish people uh, which would take Scotland out of the Union. So, you know, if that doesn't concentrate people's minds, uh, then I don't know what will. We wish people would think about it now, hence our efforts to try and stimulate this debate. Mm -hmm. OK, and a follow up or s s sort of uh, a similar territory question from a Kay Rundell who asks, um, how much harder is it for you to make the case for the kind of union you want to see when the so-called national broadcasters, BBC, ITV, etc., focus so much on the London English agenda with no real attempt to explain how the work of the devolved nations relates to the or fits in uh, to, to the UK constitution post Brexit? Uh, well, that, that is, I'm, I'm afraid, a constant uh, struggle. The UK media, I think, has become more interested uh, in Wales and uh, certainly I think it's always been interested in Scotland, but the coronavirus experience has made it more interested in Wales, but it's only, it's, it is only genuinely really interested in Wales when uh, they can run a Wales is doing something to England story. You know, they, they, do, they do seem to me always to approach these questions on the basis that England is the template and that anybody who does anything different has somehow got to justify it. Uh, because why are you doing something different to uh, what the UK government is doing? Um, there's a very good report by the late uh, Professor Anthony King uh, into the way the BBC uh, responds to a, you know, a devolved United Kingdom. Um, I do think there are people in the BBC who try hard uh, to do this. Uh, I shouldn't name uh, names, I suppose, but uh, I always think to myself, if I'm listening to the Today programme, and it's very bad for my blood pressure uh, very often, but uh, Nick Robinson does seem to me to be one of those journalists who very regularly make sure that he lets his listeners know whether the topic being discussed is a topic that is about England only or whether it's a topic that covers the whole of the United Kingdom. And that seems to me that it shows that it can be done if you have journalists who are genuinely attentive uh, to this and keen to make sure that their listeners are genuinely informed about the nature of the discussion that is taking place. So uh, mm -hmm. it's an uphill struggle, but it's not a struggle where I think you could say that not avail it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, we've had a couple of questions uh, that I'll put together to you relating to the the UK Internal Market Act, which um, you, you talked a bit about. So one is from uh, George Peretz, um, who asks, to what extent are you finding that the Internal Market Act is imposing a real constraint on Welsh government policy? So there's a lot of talk about how it 
could potentially do so, but have you already begun to see uh, those practical constraints? And then the related question, if I can now find it as I scroll um, through the many questions we've had. Yes, thank you. From Tessa Marshall, um, how can the Welsh Government challenge the implications of the, uh, the Internal Market Act, especially in relation to your commitment to addressing the climate and nature crises? Uh, well, thank you both for those. So on George's uh, point, when the internal market bill was going to the House of Lords in particular, where it was fantastically challenged uh, by people putting the, the devolution case, UK ministers were put up to say, oh, you, you shouldn't be worrying about these sort of things. These are fallback powers, these are remote powers. You know, we won't be using these every day. Well, it, in fact, it uh, turns out not to be the case at all from the very beginning. Uh, they have been uh, used. The failure of the UK government to agree for continued participation in Erasmus Plus, an act of cultural vandalism, to go with the First Minister of Scotland, uh, meant that they had to invent a substitute programme. Now, education is entirely devolved to Wales. When there was an Erasmus Plus programme at a European level, we ran it for Wales in Wales. What should have happened is that the money should have flown through the Barnet formula to us, and we would have been able to devise our own scheme in Wales. Did that happen? No, it did not. There was a UK uh, system imposed on us. No consultation, no involvement in it, completely and using internal market act powers to bypass devolution. When it came to a compensation scheme for fishermen, fishers in Wales because of uh, Brexit, fishing is entirely devolved to Wales, has been since 1999. The proper way of doing things, the routine way of doing things, there would have been a scheme for England, there would have been a consequential for Wales, we would have devised a compensation scheme, no way. The nature of Welsh, the Welsh fishing industry. Once again, the UK minister chose to use, use Internal Market Act powers to override all of that and to create a single scheme which directly cuts across devolved responsibilities. And you know, we have discussions with the UK government over their policy of free ports. They would like a free port uh, in Wales. Uh, we are prepared to uh, cooperate with them on that on certain uh, sensible conditions, but the discussion is always undercut by the fact but they come in through the door carrying a large club in their hand and they're not, they're not shy of showing it either. You know, if you don't agree, then we'll use internal market act powers to do it anyway. So I'm afraid far from being the sort of, you know, long backstop to be used in exceptional circumstances when sensible agreement can't be reached. It really is not like that at all. It is why it pours such poison into uh, the relations in the United Kingdom. Uh, Tessa's point about how we challenge it, well, we're challenging it through the courts. Uh, we think the uh, Act uh, did not respect other devolution uh, statutes. Uh, and you know, in an on the ground uh, way, uh, we are doing our best to make sure that the schemes that are imposed on us uh, do at least reflect Welsh needs and circumstances. Okay, thank you. Well, I am sorry to the several people, many people actually, who've, who've suggested questions um, that we just unfortunately do not have time to take now um, as we have reached the end of our allotted time. So um, thank you all for, for, for joining us. Uh, Mark, once again, thanks a lot for taking the time to, to speak with us about all these very important issues. Um, as mentioned, this is an ongoing series of events uh, we are holding on devolution and the union. The next one to look out for in September, the 13th of September, will be with Chloe Smith, the UK government minister for the constitution and devolution. Um, so, Mark, thank you very much.